Hello, I am Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas war. It is currently the evening of December 30th, 2023 in the United States, the morning of December 31st, 2023 in the Middle East. Before I get started, I will note that tomorrow, December 31st, I will be traveling, so there will not be a report. If there are any major updates, I'll put them on my Twitter account. Otherwise, I will be back in two days. Starting with the hostage situation, all sides right now are currently waiting for Hamas delegations to give answers. There are two channels going on. One is the Qatari delegates. Israel has been negotiating with Qatar. And the latest was that a possible deal of the release of 40 to 50 hostages in exchange for a two to three week truce and Palestinian prisoner release was given. Israel asked the Qatari delegates for clarification on Hamas's position. They are supposed to get back to them. In addition, the Egyptian proposal is still being worked out. Egypt has said that it is trying to adjust its proposal according to the demands of different sides. Hamas delegations are coming and going from Egypt. And also there, everyone is waiting for Hamas's response. So there are two channels and everyone is waiting right now for a possible breakthrough. Moving on to the ongoing fighting within the Gaza Strip. There were rockets and mortars sent from the Gaza Strip towards the southern parts of Israel, although again, like in the last week, less and less and less. Tar rockets targeted the areas of Nir Am and Miflasim. One of the speculations is that less rockets are being sent as the IDF moves towards the central and southern parts of the Gaza Strip and deepens its grip there. Hamas is having less opportunities to send rockets. It is also possible that Hamas is calculating the amount of rockets that it has and saving them for a later date. Moving on to the fighting within the Gaza Strip, it was a very intensive day from the north to the south of the Gaza Strip. In the northern parts, in Gaza City, major gun battles were reported between the IDF and different Hamas operatives. The IDF stated that it managed to kill over 30 Hamas operatives in these different battles. In addition, there were ongoing confrontations in areas that the IDF said it had already taken over. These included Sajaiya and Beit Lahia. There were also substantial bombings reported in Jabali, a refugee camp, as the IDF continues to search house by house and, and alley by alley throughout these different camps and areas in order to purge both Hamas activists as well as uncovering attack tunnels and weapons caches. Similarly, in Darj Tufakh, still in the north of the Gaza Strip, there were, the IDF continued to deepen its control of the neighborhood. Substantial, substantial gun battles were also reported in that area. Moving on to the central part of the Gaza Strip, in the El Buraj refugee camp, which the IDF invaded several days ago, substantial, substantial gun battles and confrontations were also reported. Since the IDF invasion to that camp, four launching sites and nine attack tunnels have been found. Some of these have already reportedly been destroyed. The IDF also reported that it raided a school which had internally displaced Palestinians, but where also Hamas operatives were hiding and using this as a staging ground to carry out different attacks in the refugee camp. After intensive battles, the school was taken over by the IDF. There are also continued reports of major aerial bombardments throughout the different camps in the central parts of the Gaza Strip, primarily in Nusrat refugee camp, also the city of Deir el and El Magazi refugee camp. Moving on to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip in Khan Yunis. After several days of reporting that more and more IDF divisions were pouring into the city, the IDF officially announced today that it's expanding its operation in Khan Yunis. The IDF reported that it took over Hamas's main intelligence headquarters in the city, and other main Hamas sites were taken over after intensive gun battles again reported throughout the entire areas of Khan Yunis. The reports of the IDF also taken over different weapons manufacturing areas, and that attacks involved heavy air fire and bombardments. This is in one instance in one part of the city where over 50 bombing raids were reported prior to the IDF ground forces entering the area. According to some reports, these were some of the most intensive bombings that Han Yunus has seen since the war began. In Rafah, the most southern tip of the Gaza Strip, reports of substantial artillery fire were seen in the Rafah crossing area. This is the Philadelphia line between Rafah, Gaza, and the Egyptian side, with dozens of people reporting injured and fatalities also reported. Al Jazeera stated that this is part of the IDF's plan to take over the Philadelphia line. Again, that is that border between Gaza Strip and Egypt. This is a constant blame game Different elements within the Gaza Strip have stated that the IDF's ultimate goal is, among others, to take over the Philadelphia line. The IDF has stated that it is not part of its goal, and Minister of Defense Yoav Gagan specifically stated that, according to different reports, there were massive artillery bombings along that line today. Al Jazeera said this is part of the IDF's plan. Moving on to some of the other news coming out of the Gaza Strip, Abdel Fattah Mali, who is one of the prominent figures in the Al-Qassam Brigades, that is Hamas's military wing, and the deputy of Yahya Ayash, who was known as the engineer, he was one of the leaders and founders of the Al-Qassam Brigades, and who perfected their suicide belts, who was assassinated over 25 years ago, he was assassinated today. According to reports, Abdel Fattah Mali was one of the current prominent leaders of the Al-Qassam Brigades in charge of different weapons manufacturing. Other news, the Wall Street Journal published an article today stated that nearly 70% of houses in the Gaza Strip and half of the buildings, as well as churches, mosques, schools, factories, and hotels, have all either been damaged or destroyed in the war. Two-thirds of the school are also reported to either be damaged or destroyed, and only 8 out of 36 hospitals in the Gaza Strip remain functioning.
Regarding casualties, two IDF soldiers were reported killed in the last 24 hours, bringing a total number of IDF soldiers that have been killed in the Gaza Strip to between 168 and 170 since the war began. Again, there's some discrepancy because sometimes reports come in stating that a soldier died from injuries and is unclear if this is included in the daily count or not. And 936 soldiers are reported injured since the ground invasion began of the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Health Ministry is reporting that 165 Palestinians were killed in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of Palestinians that were killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 21,672, with 56,165 reported injured. Moving on, moving on to the humanitarian situation, Al Arabi Al Jadid, reporting from Qatar, stated that Egypt has completed setting up a refugee camp on the outskirts of Han Yunus in coordination with the IDF. After it was reported several days ago that Egypt began setting up this refugee camp, according to the report, now it is complete. The report adds that this is meant to ease some of the pressure in southern Gaza, and that Egypt sent warnings to Hamas to not operate from anywhere in or around the refugee camp in order to avoid any idea of retaliations around this newly established refugee camp. Other news, the UN put out a report today in which it estimates that 150,000 Palestinians fled from central Gaza Strip and from Hanunis towards refugee camps in the Rafah area in the last week. It also stated that in total, an estimated 85% of the Gazan population, that's 2.4 million Gazans, has be have become internally displaced since the war began. Other news, Israel coordinated with the United Nations to allow the entrance of 1.4 million vaccinations against various diseases in the last days. It is to be administered in the refugee camps in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. A total of 103 trucks carrying food, water, and medical supplies are reported to enter the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. The report is from the UN, and it did not state through which crossing those trucks entered. Again, still unclear if Karim Shalom is up and active, or if these all entered through the Rafah crossing. Moving on to the West Bank. There was a Palestinian ramming attack in the Al Fawar refugee camp, the south of Mount Hebron. The ramming occurred against a military checkpoint. One soldier was injured. The Palestinian in the car was shot and killed. This comes amidst growing escalations in the last several days. There have been several attacks, some of them stabbing attacks, some of them ramming attacks. This attack was reported today. Other news, the IDF announced it is launching a major operation in the Nur Shams refugee camp in Dul Karim, aimed at tackling different terror cells in the area. Nur Shams has been a hotbed for several weeks. The IDF has carried out several operations in that area. It also have leaflets there telling the population to do not let this refugee camp become like Janine refugee camp, i.e. another hotbed that the IDF is going to operate in often. The IDF now announced that it is launching a major operation. Oh, and minutes before I recorded this, there were reports coming in of gun battles and confrontations occurring in the refugee camp, likely we'll learn tomorrow of the results. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, rockets and missiles were continuously sent in on continued escalations from the from southern Lebanon towards Israel. Rockets target the areas of Kiryat Shmona, Kibbutz Dan, where one Israeli was lately injured in, the, in a rocket attack. There's also a report of two drones that exploded in the Hardov area. It is unclear if these were suicide drones or if they were intercepted by the IDF. Other rockets were targeted areas throughout the Galilee, and it was also published today by the IDF Arabic spokesperson that many of Hezbollah targets end up actually falling in Lebanese territory and endangering the population there. Uh, he stated that in the last 24 hours, 80% of the rockets sent from Lebanon actually landed in Lebanese territory. Regarding IDF retaliations, the IDF reported they carried out a series of attacks, including two rounds of bombings against strategic Hezbollah targets in Kfar Kila, which is a, a known Hezbollah stronghold. There were other reports of IDF attacks that were carried out in the Anakura area, Meruhin, Al Jabtin, as well as Tir Harafa. In other news, Al Jazeera reported of an IDF drone attack against a car between the villages of Ita Shabab and Ramish. Two people are reported injured. Usually when these attacks are carried out against cars, that means it is somewhat of a targeted assassination where the IDF is trying to target specific individuals. Unclear who those people were at this time, but we'll find out about that tomorrow. In addition to this, and the IDF reported that it carried out attacks against three different Hezbollah units, and reports also came in of substantial damage that was done in an IDF attack against Binjbel, with one house reportedly destroyed and damage done to the surroundings. Hezbollah reported one operative killed in Binjbel, bringing the total number of Hezbollah operatives that the group states were killed since the war began to 134. Moving on to a political report, Al Ahbar, which is a news outlet in Lebanon, somewhat affiliated with Hezbollah, reported that the U.S. envoy to the area, Amos Hostin, is due to arrive in Lebanon amidst ongoing negotiations in an attempt to avoid an escalation and a regional war between Israel and Lebanon. According to the reports, Hostin's plan is to finalize the border disputes between Israel and Lebanon, specifically related to 13 points of disputes and including Israeli withdrawal from the northern part of the Rajar village, this is a village that is divided between Israel and Lebanon, in an attempt to end hostilities once and for all. The aim, so it would seem, is to end any border disputes between Israel and Lebanon and thus take away Hezbollah's excuse to launch any offensives against Israel. Unclear if this will be successful. Moving on to the Syrian front, there are reports in the last several hours of a bombing that was carried out in the Halab airport. 
Syria officially denounced Israel as carrying out the attack, and the Syrian Human Rights Observatory stated that seven people were killed and that the attack targeted an area of Iranian militia's warehouses in the Halab airport. Israel made no comment. Moving on to some of the regional developments, UK MTO announced that a security incident off the coast of the El Hudaydah port in Yemen occurred and warned ships passing in the area to avoid this location. Hours later, US Central Command announced that a Danish-owned ship was attacked and that two more ballistic missiles headed for it were intercepted by different US warships. A total of 23 attacks against maritime vessels are reported in this region since November 19th. Other news, El Miaden, another news out in Lebanon, reported today of two different attacks against U.S. bases in the Deir Azor area of Syria. It stated that five missiles were sent towards the U.S. Koniko base, and seven missiles were sent towards the Al Amr base, both located in Syria. This may be related to the ongoing back-and-forth escalations between the United States and two different militias that are affiliated with Iran. One of them is the Hezbollah brigades of Iraq, and the other is the Islamic resistance brigades. Both in the last week have attacked U.S. bases in several different instances. There have also been reports that the U.S. may have retaliated against some of them. Now there's this report. No one claimed responsibility for it. We may hear about it in the coming days. Other news related to the regional developments. A series of bombings occurred in the El Bukamal area, which is on the border between Syria and Iraq. This is known as a strategic weapons smuggling area between the two countries. Reuters reported that a convoy of eight different trucks were attacked, with four of them being destroyed, and three buildings that are used by Iranian militias in the area were also bombed as well. Nineteen people were reported killed. Fifteen of them were quoted as being not Syrian. Some reports, in addition to the Reuters, suggested that this was a convoy of Unit 108, which is one of the Hezbollah's biggest units that are in charge of weapons trafficking in the area, that was also overseen by Raza Musavi, who was the Iranian Revolutionary Guard affiliate who was assassinated several days ago, according to different reports by Israel. Israel never claimed responsibility. If this, if this is true, this is likely part of Israel's ongoing attempt to slowly suffocate Hezbollah's weapon, weapons trafficking from Iran to Hezbollah, and this would be a major escalation in that attempt. Hezbollah announced that four of its operatives were killed, and did not say specifically in this attack, however, other militias stated that, in fact, four Hezbollah operatives were killed in this attack. Different reports initially coming out blamed the United States, however, others suggested that Israel carried out the attack, especially after the United States officially put out a note saying that they did not carry out this attack. Israel, once again, made no comment. Whenever any Israeli official was asked about such attacks, they always stated, we are operating wherever we need to operate. Moving on to some of the political and general trends that developed in the last 24 hours. After reports yesterday that evacuation orders in Israel, both in the north and the south, were going to be extended by a month, the government actually approved the evacuation orders until February 29th, which again gives us some understanding of how at least the political establishment in Israel is seeing the war if the orders on civilians to live in close to the border, either with Lebanon or the border with Gaza, are now not going to be permitted to return to their homes, at least until February 29th. Other political news, there was a conversation today between Minister Gantz in Israel and German Chancellor Schultz. The two discussed the war and continuing to confront Iranian threats and the situation with Hezbollah in the north. On the news, for the second time, the Biden administration today bypassed Congress in order to approve an emergency sale to Israel. This sale this time involves rounds of tank shells that Israel has requested. There's also reports that Israel has requested from the United States to, to allow the sale of more air units, specifically Apache helicopters, but the United States is currently stalling on that request. Other news, amidst the political turmoil in Israel that have been reported and reporting and the different disagreements within the war cabinet, there were reports that Prime Minister Netanyahu forbade the head of the Mossad and the Shabak to meet with the Defense Minister of Israel, Yoav Gallant, in order to discuss coordinating sensitive operations. So last week was already reported that Yoav Gallant wanted to meet the head of the Mossad. The head of the Mossad and the Shabak technically report to the Prime Minister, so they need permission for the Prime Minister in order to meet with the head of the security establishment, i.e. the Minister of Defense. Last week was already reported that Netanyahu stopped the head of the Mossad from meeting with the Minister of Defense. Today it was reported that he also stopped the Mossad and the Shabak from meeting with the Minister of Defense and stated, at least the Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's office stated, the war cabinet is where things should be discussed. Other political news, there are ongoing exchanges of accusations between the United Nations, specifically UNRWA and Israel, regarding the entrance of humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip. Israel is claiming that UNRWA is allowing Hamas to steal this aid and then covering it up, while UNRWA is stating that Israel is mounting challenges on aid and that the IDF attacked a convoy of trucks uh, that were carrying humanitarian aid that entered the Rafah area on Thursday. Amidst this, it was a report in Israel's Channel 12 today 
that Israel is planning a diplomatic offensive against UNRWA in the future. According to the report, following accumulating evidence that UNRWA has both been allowing Hamas to use its facilities prior to and during the war, and cooperated with different elements of the group, Israel is building a file to challenge UNRWA diplomatically. Now, according to the report, Israel still recognizes that it has a need for UNRWA to continue to operate at least its humanitarian activity during the war, and the aim is to build this file and wait until after the war, and then to start gradually challenging UNRWA's position, chipping away at the different operations that it has, and gradually moving its authority over to local bodies, and eventually handing it all over to the next administering body in the Gaza Strip, i.e. to phase out UNRWA from any of its activities in the Gaza Strip. According to the report, also Israel is aware that this will lead to a major confrontation with the United States, as the United States does not see eye to eye regarding UNRWA, and sees it as having a critical role in the future rebuilding of the Gaza Strip. Moving on to speculations regarding the future of the Gaza Strip, after it was reported several days ago that there was supposed to be a meeting of Israel's war cabinet in order to start discussing the day after plan, which the United States is constantly demanding that Israel do, and that there were coalition threats, specifically from the right-wing elements of the coalition against Netanyahu, threatening that the war cabinet cannot discuss this, and Netanyahu eventually folded and in fact canceled the discussion about this. Today, Israel's finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich, who is a member of the expanded cabinet, stated in an interview that Israel should encourage Palestinians to willingly leave Gaza. He stated in a quote, We will have to help them leave and find countries that will accept them. It should be a national effort. We will have to rule there for a long time, as running from terror brings more terror. He added also explicitly that Israel, again I'm quoting, needs to start having debates about settling in the Gaza Strip. So it's important to note this in relation to that meeting of the War Cabinet. In the War Cabinet, there are not these hawkish right-wing elements. The War Cabinet is made up from Prime Minister Netanyahu, Defense Minister Gallon, Minister Gantz, and Minister Eisenkot, as well as other advisors, and specifically Smotrich was the one who pressured Netanyahu to say the War Cabinet cannot debate this. The expanded cabinet in Israel is due to meet on Tuesday in order to discuss the future of the Gaza Strip. Petalos Smotrich, one of the members of the expanded cabinet, is now stating that Israel needs to have an open debate about re-establishing settlements in the Gaza Strip. That is my report for the last 24 hours. Like I said, I will not be here tomorrow. If there are any major updates, I will update them on my Twitter account. Otherwise, I will be back on Monday.